climate change. It barely rated a mention in the campaign. What a contrast to election 07 when Kevin Rudd famously stated global warming was the greatest environmental and economic challenge of our time. Australia's newly appointed Environment Minister Josh Frydenberg now also carries responsibility for the energy portfolio. The marriage of both policy areas was generally welcomed by Green groups, but it was the appointment of the minister often known as Mr Cole that raised a few eyebrows. So there is a strong moral case that the green activists sometimes don't comprehend. So, so Australia has a big role to play because we're the second largest exporter of coal in the world. But Josh Frydenberg has since changed his mind somewhat. Here, is, here he is just last month on the campaign trail sounding a little less like coal's cheerleader in chief. Is that the Australian economy is in transition. We are moving away from coal and that is not a bad thing. Josh Frydenberg joined me here in the studio for his first interview as Environment and Energy Minister. Josh Frydenberg, thanks very much for coming in. Nice to be with you, Emma. Let's start off with just a clarification of exactly where you stand on the science of climate change. I accept the science of climate change and recognise that Australia needs to do its part as the globe uh, tackles uh, climate change and emissions reduction. Uh, Australia has very ambitious uh, targets of a 26 to 28 per cent reduction by 2030 on our 2005 levels. On a per capita basis that's more than 50 per cent and that is a strong target among the highest in the world and I'm very pleased to be part of a government that has subscribed to those targets. When you say you accept the science, you accept all, all sides of the science, the fact that it's man-made? Ab look, absolutely accept that uh, man is contributing uh, to climate change and we are part of a, more than 190 nations that agreed in Paris to these targets and that's a response to the challenge that is posed to the world by climate change. The Turnbull government agreed in Paris to the objectives of keeping global warming to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels mm. and to pursue efforts to limit the rise to 1.5 degrees. Mm. The Prime Minister has recognised this means a net zero emissions economy. Do you agree with him? Well, over time, that's where we are heading. But right now, there's a significant transition that is occurring in the economy. Uh, and we are seeing a decline in coal as a part of our overall energy mix. It was well above 70% in 2004. It's down to around 60% today and will decline over time. And in fact, Emma, if you look at the 12 uh, most emission intensive uh, uh, power generation uh, facilities in Australia, um, eight of those have closed over the last five years, all of which were coal. And of course, with the renewable energy target, which will see 23.5% of our electricity generation by 2020 coming from renewable sources, you will see renewable energy take the place of coal uh, as, a, uh, as an important energy source. Over what time frame will we get to zero emissions? Well, I don't know, I'm putting a time frame on it today, but it will, the transition is occurring. Uh, in the economy and Australia is on track to meet its 2020 targets and after that we've got our 2030 targets. Do you see as a priority in your new role a transition and a national plan that attaches a transition mm. to zero emissions? Look, I think the Australian people expect us uh, to be moving to cleaner forms of energy. Uh, my goal is to create affordable, uh, accessible and reliable energy supply as we move to a lower emissions future. And as we've seen in recent, two recent cases in Australia, one in Tasmania when BassLink went down and that combined with the drought uh, to see you know, diesel generators uh, have to be set up in order to supply uh, energy in that state. And in South Australia we've seen wild fluctuations in the spot price of electricity and there was a number of factors at play there. Uh, but those two uh, cases were a wake-up call for us and that is why I've called together the state and the territory 
energy ministers in Canberra on the 19th of August as part of the COAG Energy Council to decide uh, on how we can improve the coordination and cooperation between states, territories and the federal government. Give us your assessment. You just mentioned South Australia. What mm. is your assessment of what's going on there where el electricity prices have been soaring? There's competing views about what's at play there. We know that South Australia is generating its electricity, 40% of which comes mm. from renewables. Uh, there's a lot of issues at play. What, what do you make of uh, what's going on there? Well, there were sort of four key factors that were responsible for those, uh, those wild fluctuations in the spot price, where it went from just above $500 a megawatt hour up to $14,000 in the one day. I mean, that's quite remarkable. And there has been a steady increase in electricity prices in South Australia. You know, the main reason was the Haywood interconnector uh, was being upgraded, and that supplies electricity uh, from Victoria, uh, coal-fired electricity, into South Australia. The other reason at play here for, those, uh, for the wild fluctuations was the increase in demand for electricity because there was a, a cold snap. Uh, and, and, and that played there. Then spot prices for gas were very high. Uh, we need more gas supply and more gas suppliers in, the, in Australia and, and, and gas is an important part of the energy mix. And then the other factor was that renewables, particularly in South Australia, you, you mentioned 41% coming from renewables, 37% of that is, uh, is wind and 4% is solar. Uh, th that is intermittent supply, meaning that when you know, the sun's not shining and the wind's not blowing, it's not supplied. So South Australia needs backup and that intermittent supply meant that there was a greater need for backup and that backup was expensive. Now, you gave a speech at the Brookings Institute in the US in February of this year where you expressed long-term optimism mm. about the coal industry. Are you still feeling optimistic about the future of coal? Well, if you look around the world, uh, there is an increased demand for coal in a country like India because they have 300 million people who don't have access to electricity or little access to electricity. Now, they're quadrupling their investment in renewables, but they're also taking out other forms of improvement to their um, energy supply uh, with uh, an increase in, in use of some fossil fuels like, like coal. But in other countries, Emma, it, the, the use of coal is decreasing quite substantially and I talked about Australia. So it's a, it's a mixed, it's a mixed it, message around the Pardon the world. interruption because I don't want to run out of time. Sure. Isn't it incumbent on a country like ours where our PM is constantly talking about innovation to work on alternative energy sure. sources for places like India to help them as well as us meet the global emission reduction goals? Look, absolutely. And we are co cooperating with India and I remember... But at that same Brookings speech, uh, sorry again to interrupt yeah. you, you were talking about how great it was for Australia that India was demanding more coal. Well, India's demanding more gas too and that's good news for Australia. Um, the point is, you know, coal is an important sector in Australia, uh, but the, the global picture about coal is it will remain important, but it's of a declining share of the overall energy mix. That's, that's what I've said uh, previously. The, the key point here is that Australia is undergoing a transition in energy markets. And you can't just switch off the lights tomorrow and suddenly turn them on with 100% renewables. You can't But are you do working that. on a plan to replace the ageing coal fleet in this country with clean energy? We're absolutely cooperating at a state and territory level in the federal government. But you'll have to, to lead that, won't you? Absolutely. And you know, very cognizant of that transition. Can I just say that technology, because I also made this very clear in that Brookings speech, Emma, technology is the big swing factor in, in energy markets. Uh, I'm told by the CSIRO that over the next 10 years, battery storage costs will come down 60%. And if you can store the intermittent energy like solar and wind uh, with batteries, as you're doing it now, in, uh, in, in vehicles, for example, with the Tesla vehicles and so forth, then that creates huge new opportunities uh, for, the, uh, for the rollout of renewables across the commercial and the household sectors. Now, the Australian government has previously committed to examine a long-term emissions reduction goal as part of a 2017 review of its climate policies. Is, is that still the plan? Because the US and Canada have committed to having 2050 climate plans by the end of this year. Well. Our plans are a 2020 plan for the renewable energy target, a, 20, a 2030 plan for our Paris commitments, and of course, in due course, 
we will be working out our future plans. But can we expect that in 2017 you'll say something about 2050? Because it's not enough, is it, to just have a plan for a 2030 target without consideration of the longer term objective of decarbonising yeah. the economy? Yeah, well, we're, our focus is on the here and now, and we've got important targets in place. As for next year's review, we will work out the terms of reference as we, as we go along. And finally, Australia's largest coal mine, Adani's Carmichael Mine, what impact will the burning of the coal from that mine have on climate change and therefore the Great Barrier Reef? Well, climate change is the big, biggest threat to the Barrier Reef and we've seen a significant bleaching event there, about 22% mortality. Uh, and that's why uh, the world is coming together, 190 plus nations at Paris, to try to reduce uh, to climate change and uh, the impact of climate change and our emissions. Uh, our emissions outlook. But as for coal, like I said, it's of declining, uh, declining proportion of the overall energy mix. And, but we've, there is and we've said yes to a, an enormous mine like Carmichael. And in the end, Australia doesn't want to continue supporting coal mining operations and then wind up with a bunch of stranded assets, do we? But, you know, coal is still a part of the energy mix. You have to accept that, but it's also a major transition that is underway from coal. Now Australia uh, has more than 40,000 jobs in that sector as you know it's our second largest export behind iron ore. We don't talk just about thermal coal, we've also got coking coal and you don't build a wind turbine or a solar panel without coking coal and other forms of, um, of natural resources. So it's a very complex picture but we have an optimistic um, story to tell us in Australia. The transition is underway. Renewables are a critical part of that. Technology is going to really see a step up, a step change uh, in the uptake of renewables. Australia's have a great record, whether it's in solar PV on their roofs or whether it's in large scale uh, renewable systems um, and we can help lead the world in emissions reduction technology. Josh Frydenberg, thank you for your time. Nice to be with you.